The Subcommittee on Oversight, Management, and Accountability will come to order. Thank you so much for your patience as we had to move this around a bit because of votes. Good afternoon. We are here today to discuss the Department of Homeland Security, DHS's effort to cultivate a diverse and inclusive workforce. Across the department's wide and varied missions, one thing remains constant, the important, uh, importance of a workforce that is as diverse as the homeland it seeks to protect. The committee last held a hearing on this topic in 2009 after learning that racial minorities constituted only 20% of the DHS workforce and 10% of leadership positions. At that time, the committee heard from the department about some of its efforts to recruit and retain a more diverse talent. Ten years later, those numbers have improved, with higher representation of minorities, women, and people with disabilities in the DHS workforce. But the department still has a way to go to achieve equal representation across the department and increase the number of minorities and women in leadership positions. Vital to ensuring that these goals are met is a commitment to better understanding the barriers and developing plans to address those barriers. In some areas, the department has taken steps to do this. In 2014, a DHS review of women in law enforcement found that the department employed fewer female law enforcement officers than the rest of the federal government. The review found that some women felt the working environment forced them to choose between their career and their families. Addition, a 2018 study of why women leave the United States Coast Guard found that women were leaving the, comp the component at much higher rates than men. The study noted that this was due in part to gender bias and a belief that women had to work twice as hard to prove themselves as men and were not given the same advancement opportunities. In response, the DHS began implementing a mentorship program for women in law enforcement positions last year and had 36 pairs of mentors and mentees. Currently, women hold on average 25% of the positions in DHS law enforcement agencies. So I look forward to seeing if this new mentorship program helps the department retain and promote more women in these positions. The department also struggles to ensure its most crucial mission areas incorporate the views of traditionally underserved populations. In areas like emergency management, border security, and domestic terrorism prevention, it's vital that the department proactively consider and directly communicate with all communities. Confusion, miscommunication, and distrust in emergency situations can lead to unnecessary loss of life. Unfortunately, we saw this play out in the delayed disaster assistance in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria due to an, in, an insufficient number of bilingual employees. FEMA's lack of Spanish-speaking employees caused problems throughout the disaster response and contributed to delays in getting assistance to people who needed it most. This serves as a reminder of the importance of including people with diverse backgrounds in the formulation of plans, policies, and procedures. DHS's mission is best served by ensuring that women, minorities, and people with disabilities not only have the opportunity to participate, but also to lead. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about how DHS is working to identify the various challenges its components face in creating a diverse and inclusive working environment, and how the department is meeting those challenges. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Crenshaw, for an opening statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Torres-Small, and I appreciate the opportunity to discuss diversity at the Department of Homeland Security. As we all know, the more than 200,000 people that work at DHS uh, carry out a wide-ranging and increasingly difficult mission to protect Americans and our way of life. It is their dedication to protecting the homeland and the American people that drives the success of DHS as a whole. It is for that reason that we must continue to ensure that DHS workforce is prepared for the job at hand. And, and America is a diverse country, and American citizens have a wide range of backgrounds and experiences. DHS has stated that to perform its mission well, it must rely on a workforce as diverse as our country itself. DHS has put in place many initiatives and programs to accomplish that goal. Fostering a sense of inclusion within DHS helps the agency promote collaboration, creativity, and innovation, high performance. This helps detect blind spots, empowers employees to lead and trust their teammates, and fosters a devotion to the mission at DHS. 
Since its inception in 2003, DHS has come a long way in fostering a diverse workforce that includes a strong representative population from all minority groups, as well as women and veterans. As of January 2020, the DHS workforce was made up of 22% Hispanic or Latino, 16% Black or African American, and 8% American Indian or Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. Of the nearly 200,000 employees, 35% are women and more than 25% are veterans. Current efforts at DHS, like developing robust internship programs, recruiting at minority serving institutions, and veterans hiring initiatives will all help in continuing this progress, especially at senior executive services levels. I look forward to hearing more about the recruitment efforts and how the department is working to promote diversity throughout its policies from the chief human capital officer. Policies and procedures at DHS are also a part of a holistic approach to diversity at DHS. The, Gov the Government Accountability Office has reviewed how DHS manages equal employment opportunity uh, policies that include training, leadership development, and other efforts to create an inclusive workplace. The review included six recommendations to DHS, and DHS concurred with all six. The implementation process for these recommendations at DHS is currently underway, and I look forward to discussing the progress today. Diversity in the workplace can help DHS with its underlying mission of protecting Americans. Congress has an important role to play in ensuring that they have the tools they need to meet this goal. We also re must recognize that painting DHS employees as bad people, uncaring, or saying that the department should be dissolved altogether is counter to this goal. Mean-spirited politics and the demonization of the DHS workforce undermines the goal of hiring a more diverse workforce. I hope that we can work together productively to identify opportunities for improvement across DHS's efforts at today's hearing. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Crenshaw. The uh, other members of the committee are reminded that under the committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. I now welcome our panel of witnesses and thank you for joining us today. First, welcome back to Ms. Angela Bailey, Chief Human Capital Officer of the Department of Homeland Security. In that role, she is responsible for the department's human capital program, including human resource policy, recruitment and hiring, and employee development. She has dedicated more than 38 years to a career in public service, and more than um, with 32 of those years in human resources. Ms. Bailey was appointed to her current position in January 2016. Our second witness, Ms. Yvonne Jones, is a director in the Government Accountability Office's Strategic Issues Team. She joined GAO in November 2003. Ms. Jones oversees human capital management issues, including diversity and inclusion issues, such as the participation rate of individuals with disabilities and the employment satisfaction of veterans in federal service. She also leads GAO's work on government-wide adoption of enhanced program and project management. Without objection, the witness's full statements will be inserted in the record. I now ask each witness to summarize her statement for five minutes, beginning with Ms. Angela Bailey. Thank you. Chairwoman Torres Small, Ranking Member Crenshaw, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss inclusive diversity at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. DHS is one of the most ethnically and racially diverse agencies across the federal government, far surpassing government-wide workforce diversity percentages. Nearly one out of every two employee has identified themselves with a diverse racial or ethnic group. Almost one-third of DHS employees are millennials, and over 50% of them identify as diverse. DHS has the largest percentage of Hispanics in the federal workforce by a large margin, 22% higher than 9% working in the rest of the federal government or in private sector occupations comparable to our positions. Women comprise 35% of the DHS workforce overall, and in our non-law enforcement positions, women make up almost 50%. This diversity is also reflected in our executives. 22% of our senior executives identify with a diverse racial or ethnic group, a number that is on par with the rest of the federal workforce. <coughs> and at DHS, women comprise nearly 30% of our SES. <coughs> Excuse me. DHS also strives to be a model employer for individuals with disabilities. Even regarding employees with the most severe disabilities, we have made tremendous progress and we have exceeded federal hiring goals last quarter. Finally, 
I am extremely proud to talk about our veterans hiring at DHS. We are one of the leaders across the federal government. We've received the Council on Veterans Employment's highest rating of exemplary for the last four years. Almost one third of our employees are veterans and 10% of them live with a disability every single day, making us number one among the agencies of similar sizes. While we have an exemplary record, we would like to do more. Our Enhanced Hiring Act proposal is designed to streamline our ability to hire veterans. We look forward to working with you to make this proposal a reality. Getting to these successful results has taken time and innovative thinking. In 2016, the department shifted to a new way of thinking, moving from traditional diversity and inclusion to the concept of inclusive diversity. Inclusive diversity, which includes behaviors that promote collaboration and high performance, creativity and innovation, fairness and respect, is about deliberately and thoughtfully creating an environment where employees know they belong and where they feel their supervisor or someone at work cares about them. The concepts of caring and compassion are not new, but recognizing the importance and the effects they play on the operational readiness is groundbreaking in the federal government. DHS's commitment to inclusion is reflected in our 5% increase in the past four years on the Inclusion Index, a part of the FEVs. To continue this progress, we are investing and synchronizing our inclusion, engagement, and leadership development efforts. As I testified last month before this subcommittee, DHS has strengthened its agency-wide leadership development programs by providing more opportunities for lower grade employees to begin their leadership journey. We know that these approaches help employees feel valued, and the cornerstone of our engagement, retention, and inclusion efforts is our Employee and Family Readiness Program. DHS currently has seven suites of programs in place, all designed to deepen employees' sense of belonging, connection, and being cared for and within the department. In closing, engaging the entire workforce and sustaining the highest levels of integrity, accountability, and professionalism is paramount to promote and achieve the strategic vision we have for inclusive diversity. We understand that while we have made significant progress, we still have more work to do to achieve a fully inclusive culture. As we move forward, we will continue to embrace workplace cultures that are fair and respectful and value the unique contributions of each employee to enable all employees to achieve their full potential. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your testimony. I now recognize Ms. Jones to summarize her statement for five minutes. Thank you. Chairwoman Torres Small, Ranking Member Crenshaw, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss our work on the Department of Homeland Security's DHS efforts to ensure equal employment opportunity, EEO, in its workforce. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, requires that annually each executive agency assess and report its efforts to promote EEO by completing Management Directive 715, MD 715 report. DHS analyzes its workforce data to help identify indicators of potential EEO barriers, and DHS reports some improvements in representation of minorities and women and in employee engagement. DHS officials told us that minority representation was up 3% and female representation was up 2% from 2015 to 2019. Further, DHS's employee engagement scores increased from 54% in 2014 to 60% in 2017. Recruitment is an important way to ensure an agency's workforce reflects the relevant civilian labor force. Effectively, agencies need to examine applicant flow data. In July 2017, EEOC informed DHS that the agency's applicant flow data were incomplete, which makes it difficult to pinpoint barrier, bar barriers. Officials of DHS's Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Office, CRCL, told us that DHS is developing a new system to integrate applicant flow data department-wide. However, they could not tell us when they expect the system to be completed. DHS does not have complete performance metrics for tracking progress toward eliminating its EEO barriers. CRCL officials stated they are not required to establish performance metrics beyond what is included in the department-wide MD-715 report. 
but EEOC guidance states that agencies are not prevented from establishing additional practices that exceed its requirements. Implementing performance metrics could help DHS better assess its progress in eliminating EEO barriers. DHS and its components lack adequate staffing to address EEO program deficiencies because they do not have formal staffing models to assess staffing needs. However, MD715 guidance states that an agency must provide its EEO program with sufficient budget and staffing. Developing and utilizing formal staffing models for their EEO programs could help DHS and its components uh, to better identify requests and obtain the staff they need. From 2014 through 2017, EEOC found areas of noncompliance in DHS and its component EEO programs. We found that DHS components had not responded timely and completely to noncompliance identified in EEOC feedback letters. According to CRCL officials, they do not have policies and procedures to ensure that components have addressed EEOC's feedback letters completely and timely. However, MD715 guidance states that an agency's EEO director ultimately is responsible for ensuring equal opportunity throughout the agency. CRCL officials said they lack authority to ensure components' compliance with EEOC requirements, but DHS has not taken steps to analyze options to address EEO program management weaknesses to ensure DHS components comply with MD715 guidance. While DHS has weaknesses, it has, it has taken steps to address EEOC and GAO recommendations. In conclusion, as the third largest U.S. government department, the challenges DHS has faced to fully implement effective EEO programs may result in widespread negative consequences such as monetary expenses borne by the agency due to workplace disputes and de decreased morale. We found areas for improvement in DHS and its components EEO programs that could help ensure success and compliance with MD-715. The commitment of DHS's leadership is essential to successfully addressing these issues. Chairwoman Torres Small, Ranking Member Crenshaw, members of the subcommittee, this completes my prepared statement. I would be pleased to respond to any questions you may have at this time. I thank both witnesses for their testimony, and I will remind each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the panel. I will now recognize myself for questions. Uh, we heard in today about the steps DHS has taken to improve the diversity of its workforce, and I deeply want to acknowledge the work that's been done since 2009. I appreciate um, the efforts that you have put in place, and as Ms. Bailey noted, DHS DHS's workforce as a whole is reasonably diverse, uh, and thanks in large part to the diversity in the workforces at CBP and TSA. But I, I do disagree slightly with the comments about the diversity of leadership, leadership at the senior leadership level. The department still struggles to promote women and racial minorities to leadership positions. For example, at TSA, which is generally quite diverse, 55% uh, of employees identify as minorities there. However, only 21% are in leadership positions. At DHS headquarters, 30% of employees are African American, but only make up 8% of leadership. Women make up less than a quarter of senior leaders at components like Secret Service and CBP, and across the entire department, women only hold 30% of leadership positions overall. Uh, for Ms. Bailey, has DHS performed any analysis specifically to components like TSA and CBP, which have a high workforce participation for racial minorities that is not reflected among leadership? Yes, actually we have, so thank you for the question. Um, one of the things that we do within our program is we meet with them on, if not a monthly, but I think it's a quarterly basis with each of the components to really identify what are some of the opportunities that they might have to increase the pipeline. Because one of the things that we've found is that with our, um, with our diversity within our SES, we firmly believe that building the, the diversity of the pipeline at the 14 and 15 level is significantly important for us. 
And so we have deployed um, a few strategies to make sure that we get the word out and that they understand how to get, for example, into the SES CDP program, just to give you an example. Um, and so as a result of some of these specific um, tactical and strategic efforts that we've had, we've actually increased our pipeline, and we've been very pleased about that. So in our pipeline, while we have 30% women in SES, our pipeline is at 36%. Um, while we are 22% diverse in our SES, 34% diverse in our pipeline, just to give you an example. So what we found is, is by building up the pipeline, by giving them the opportunities, especially for our lower graded employees, creating career paths for them, giving them rotational opportunities, et cetera, we're able to build um, a more diverse SES. And Ms. Bailey, what specific analyses have, have you done to create those findings or to, to uh, establish those findings? Oh. Yes, so with regard to the specific analysis, um, we've actually gone in and we dissect every single ounce of the data that we have available to us. So we can pull all of the demographic data, we can pull it by region, we can pull it locally or by it, not just the specific component but within the organization. Have you well. talked to employees about what's keeping them from, getting, from, from entering that pipeline at the 13 and 14 level? Yes, in our conversations with our employees, some of the things go to actually some of the things that you mentioned in your opening statement. And I'm sorry, was there a comprehensive analysis? Where did you produce any reports about it? No, we did not produce a report. Instead, what we did is we just kind of gathered the information that's within my office, but it wasn't done as a report. And was it a, a questionnaire for the entire, uh, for TSA-wide or CBP-wide or just anecdotal conversations? Right, it was more focus groups, like sitting down with them and listening, and also working with the um, diversity and inclusion um, steering committee that we have with all of the components so that we can dig in a little bit deeper and understand what are the barriers that are keeping some of them uh, from actually, you know, becoming, um, progressing within their career. Thank you. I appreciate the anecdotal work you've done there. I think formalizing it could help capture people who uh, aren't always listened to or included in those conversations and maybe some of the folks you're missing when it comes to pipelines. Um, switching now uh, to the mentorship program for women in law enforcement. Ms. Jones, GAO's, GAO's report noted that DHS did not have performance metrics to track the retention rate of women in law enforcement positions. How has the department responded and addressed this issue, if at all? We did include um, a recommendation in our, in our report saying that we thought that the secretary should uh, work the, with the different units in the department to develop performance metrics. So DHS did agree with that recommendation. Um, <clears throat> we spoke to um, appropriate officials at DHS earlier this month. They informed us um, that they are uh, developing a proposal for performance metrics, that it will be examined by the appropriate units in DHS, and they do hope that they will um, have developed a proposal by the end of this fiscal year. The end of this fiscal year is the deadline? Pardon? The end of this fiscal year is the deadline? That's, yes, that's the deadline that they indicated. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My time has expired. I now recognize for five minutes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Crenshaw. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, Ms. Jones, in your, in your testimony, I saw a lot of mentions of, of barriers and the importance of identifying and addressing those barriers. So I, I want to get a better understanding of, of how you define what constitutes a barrier and how you differentiate between intentional barriers to promotion or hiring and unintentional barriers and what you have, done, have identified at DHS. Okay. Well, a, a barrier... Um, EEO de EEOC defines a barrier as a policy, a program, procedures, actions that may prevent individuals in some groups from having the same kind of, of opportunities, um, whether that is for hiring or promotion, having the, not having the same opportunities as other groups in, in an organization. And what did you identify? And let's first start with the with intentional barriers. Were there any intentional barriers identified? We did, we did not. Um, and then what about unintentional barriers? And so what exactly should we be looking at? Okay. Well, as I said, we didn't um, really um, identify um, in intentional uh, barriers. Um, D DHS itself 
identified barriers and they, they define them as problems with supervi supervision and management or lack of advancement opportunities for some uh, groups of staff, la lack of alternative wor work, uh, work schedules. They also indicated that certain jobs in certain geographic locations, um, certain yeah. ethnic groups were not applying in the same, in the same number or being hired in those locations. Okay. They did identify um, a barri barriers for people with disabilities or targeted disabilities for certain positions in law enforcement, that there are medical and physical requirements that would be difficult uh, for, for them to... Like they won't hire somebody with one eye or something like that? I'm just um, It's I've... a joke. You can laugh. <laughs> okay. uh, so I'll let Ms. Bailey then finish, because if, if DHS is the one that, that, that actually answered those questions, then maybe you could expand on, on that list as well, Ms. Ms. Bailey. Yes, certainly. Um, so with regard to intentional, I want to just be really clear that we do not have intentional barriers. Well, that's good. Yeah, that's good. And that we, we should clear that up. That's yeah. why I asked. We do not have intentional barriers. There are always going to be these unintended consequences of some of the positions, some of the locations, some of the things that, um, that we know uh, that are going to be a barrier for, for women, as an example. Um, and so one of the things that we've done is really started to dissect, and this is where I testified about this before, but this is where our employee and family readiness um, um, council really kind of, kind of comes into play here. This is where going out and actually talking to people and find out what it is that's creating a barrier for them and then addressing that. So if it's things such as the remote locations, for example, uh, down on the border locations, then implementing rotational programs that allow them after a couple of years the opportunity to go to a more urban area so that they can make sure that their spouses have employment or they can make sure that they have access to uh, quality health care and things like that. So that is one, one area that, that we've uh, recognized. Do, but does something like that affect diversity? I mean, would, would, a, would a factor like that affect one demographic group over another? It seems like that would affect everybody. Yes, it would if you're you're absolutely right. It it would affect um, it can affect everyone, right? It really depends on it really depends on the individual sure. and, and things. And so I'm not really trying to just call it out to be women, and that probably was a mistake on my part, is to say that we tried to actually implement those kinds of programs so that we could allow people the opportunity to actually advance, if you will. Um, so we also, though, have identified, with regard to supervisors and, and leadership, then we need to synchronize all of our efforts between our leadership development programs, our employee and family readiness programs, our inclusive diversity programs, our engagement programs, because they cannot be all these one-off programs that are all trying to attack and do the same thing. And so by synchronizing these efforts and being very clear and deliberate on what are the things that we want to deploy and make sure that are available for all of our employees, then what we've found is that we are able then to raise up their opportunities uh, across the board. Yeah. And I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll actually stop there and, um, and maybe, well, maybe my, my last question would be, you know, what are, what are the goals with respect to diversity? Um, is, it, is it simply removing the barriers or are there are there proportional quotas that we're, that we're actually looking for as well? Have those ever been identified? No, we cannot have quotas. So, um, so there's a couple of things here, and I, I like to say it this way. With, with diversity, we are not after filling Noah's Ark. Mm -hmm. It cannot be that if you have two of everything, therefore we're diverse. And to be honest, the most important thing for us is, is once we get people on, on board, regardless, and again, one out of every two DHS employee has identified themselves as being in some type of diverse category. And that doesn't even cover things like generational diversity, right, or, or neurodisability, such as autism and things like that. And so the definitions that we have are old school. We need to actually get new school uh, definitions of what, the, what diversity is really all about. But for us within DHS, once we have folks on board, then it becomes in a way a colorblind kind of situation for us. And what we're really looking for instead is ensuring that they feel included, that they feel like they're cared for, that they understand that we have a compassionate need for what they're doing, and then therefore that helps them, we believe, not only do we then have operational readiness, but it helps them provide caring and compassion service to the American public that they serve. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Gonna go for another quick round. 
Okay. You. All right. Uh, I'll recognize myself for another five minutes. Uh, just quickly, I appreciate the discussion my colleague was having about the barrier analysis and that was done by DHS. And uh, TSA successfully did a barrier analysis. However, there were other components like FLETC and Secret for Service that did not. And in 2017, EEOC provided notice of noncompliance to six of eight DHS components and required five of those to establish plans to correct those EEOC. EO deficiencies. Um, so those three of those components, CBP, FEMA, and USCIS, never responded a timely or provided a timely response to EEOC. So Ms. Bailey, what actions has the DHS headquarters taken to coordinate with the components to ensure that they comply with EEOC requirements? So to speak within my program area, I can tell you that one of the things that we're doing is we, and I had mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we sit down with each component now and go over what are the barriers, not only to recruiting. So, so are, you, are you saying that complying with EEO uh, requirements is not within your area? It's, yeah, so the, the um, yes, correct. So as the Chico, the... Um, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, mm -hmm. our executive director, that would fall under their pre preview. But I want to be clear that we work in partnership together to address these things. And so, but I just want to make sure that I'm speaking just for the areas that I'm, uh, you know, responsible for. And so, with regard to that, and that's fine. That, that answers the question that, that you don't take on that responsibility. And, and for that, you you allow the Civil Rights and Civil Liberties to enforce those requirements. That's correct. Okay. Uh, moving on just quietly, also I appreciate your comment about not wanting to work in silos and finding ways to uh, to address the challenges. And, and I do appreciate you noting the remote, um, the challenges in hiring in remote or hardship areas right. and finding some way to prioritize that. Um, so that's something you've heard from uh, CBP officers and, and agents, for example? Yes, absolutely. We have done a a tremendous amount of listening tours where we have gone out and sat down. And so I do appreciate your comment about making sure that this is like captured somewhere and in a report. But I will tell you, there is nothing more powerful than a than sitting down with someone eye, eyeball to eyeball and having a conversation with them and really understanding what the issues are or what's the underlying issues versus just sending out a survey and they can check yes or no or one through five, how happy are they kind of thing. We don't really get to then understand what their issues are. By doing so, we were able to discover things like... So, Ms. Bailey, I appreciate that. And just to, to follow up on that, because I do agree that eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball conversations can help you truly understand the challenges folks are facing. And then the question is, what do you do with that information? Right. Have you made a recommendation to CBP that they... Uh, they allow, for example, after serving in hardship areas to have uh, prioritization in being located in another part, place within the sector? Yes, absolutely, and it's something that they're actually adopting. And one of the other things that they're doing as an example is uh, take child care. Rather than just a subsidy, they're looking at things like how do we provide child care that goes beyond the tri typical nine to five, just as an example. Um, so they, CBP is very good about taking the information that we're, that we're gathering because they're there with us when we do these listening tours. We don't go out by ourselves. And so they kind of have a list and they're going through the list and, and they have one of the, probably the top notch programs when it comes to resiliency and trying to do the best that they can for their employees. It's something I'm, I'm deeply focused on as well, representing one of the most rural uh, places along the border. I represent about 179 miles of U.S.-Mexico border, and finding those solutions in recruitment and retention is deeply important to the success of uh, security of our borders. Yes. With that, I'll yield the remainder of my time and uh, recognize for any additional questions my colleague from uh, Texas, gentleman, Mr. Crenshaw. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I, I, just, have, I just have one more I want to want to bring up, which was um, the, uh, the inclusion quotient or index in the Federal Employee Viewpoint, Viewpoints Survey. Um, Ms. Bailey said 54% of employees responded positively to the workforce environment questions. Um, how does that compare to the rest of federal government? How are we doing? With, re with regard to the rest of the federal government, I think that we're slightly below, but we have made tremendous progress. So we have gone up five percentage points in the last four years, but it, it's absolutely an area of room for improvement for us. We 
you know, we don't like kind of gloss over that and say that it's not. And so one of the, again, one of the things that we're doing is making sure that we're getting our efforts as synchronized as possible so that we can go after what is the most important things for our employees to make sure that they felt that they are cared for in a very compassionate way. Okay. Um, well, you know what, I actually, I will go back to, to our previous conversation about, um, about barriers. And so we've identified a couple um, but it was such a short conversation. I, I want to get maybe a couple more examples from you on, a, on barriers identified that maybe prevent um, promotion or hiring and, and some concrete examples of, 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 or ideas of, of how we plan to fix that. Okay, so with regard to, um, I'll give you an example of one of the barriers. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do with regard to students, this is probably one of the best examples of why things are kind of broken and we really uh, appreciate your support on, on our Enhanced Hiring Act. And one of those has to do with, we at the Coast Guard at our shipyard in Baltimore, we actually have these wonderful mentoring, coaching, internship programs with some of the schools within Baltimore and the public schools. We have the diversity to see young African American women who are being trained to be welders and painters and electricians and and young um, Hispanics being able to get a, just a wonderful career opportunity. And then whenever we go to like convert them or be able to give them the opportunity to actually work for us full time in the Coast Guard, we have to then turn around and say to them, hey, by the way, why don't you go apply on USA Jobs with a thousand other people? And then they don't even make the search for the very jobs that we provided them an opportunity for interned them and also provided them, you know, wonderful coaching and mentoring. And so it is shameful that we have rules on the books that don't even allow us the opportunity to give kids an opportunity, come in, and then tell them that they have to throw that career away because they didn't make the, right. the cert. So, so, so we're actually training them in those skill sets as, as contractors, is that? No, no. as federal employees. As, as federal contract. employees, but they, can't, but they can't then apply to the Coast Guard they can apply, but they're applying with a thousand other. Right, right. USA right? Jobs is a. And so, yeah, we what know. happens then is that they're not going to typically. They're not going to then make the list. They're not going right. to be able to. You know, maybe they don't know how to write their resume correctly or whatever the answer might be. So, what are we doing about that? We're saying, okay, these are the rules. So now we sit down with them and we help them. Here's how you write a federal resume. Here's the things that you need to do. The other thing that we're doing is, rather than just having the HR office now say that whether they're qualified or not, no, give it to the actual wel welder who's at the Coast Guard and let them decide who mm -hmm. is qualified to be you know, a welder and stuff. So in other words, engaging the subject matter experts. So while it irritates me, that we cannot have a simplified way of getting students on board into DHS. We're not going to let it be an excuse for why we're not going to do everything in our power to get these kids into these um, really exceptional careers. Okay. Great to know. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, the chairwoman now recognizes for five minutes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Barragan. Great. Thank you. Um, Ms. Jones, in, in July of 2019, uh, rather, the July 2019 report on DHS's Equal Employment Opportunity Program, GAO, found that DHS was not fully tracking data on the demographics of its job applicants, such as their race and sex, which is important for identifying and addressing potential recruitment and outreach barriers. According to the same report, DHS reported challenges in collecting department-wide data that could help identify potential barriers. Can you tell us more about the importance of this data, especially in the context of an EEO program, and what are the challenges the DHS faces in collecting and using this data? Yes, um, I can. So first of all, um, the demographic data is really important. I mean, the technical term is applicant flow data, but Having that, having comprehensive data and an and agency having the capability of analyzing it means that they get some sense of whether their recruitment efforts are working or not because they can see who's applying to, to what positions and they can get a sense of the efficiency and inclusive, inclusivity uh, of their efforts. One of the challenges at DHS is that they don't have department-wide applicant flow data. 
They have two different applicant systems with different data. So what they have to do is um, more, I would call it more manually, take data from the two systems and then compare it and analyze it. So one of our recommendations in our July report was that they um, develop a department-wide um, system. And uh, as a matter of fact, they, they have agreed with that and they are going to try to develop that kind of system, but it will require the support of DHS leadership to develop that system. Do we know if it's a matter of resources or time or what the barrier is to get it moving? Um, we were told partly that, that um, it's, it's a matter of resources, which would be um, both budget and staff. Okay. Um, according to an internal study conducted in 2018, DHS found that several minority groups, women and people with disabilities, were leaving the de department in higher than expected rates. The top three reasons for departures among these groups were, number one, problems with supervision or management. Number two, lack of advancement in opportunities. And three, was personal or family-related reasons. Ms. Jones, do you believe DHS is doing enough to address these issues? Um, I think that DHS is certainly aware of them and that they are taking steps to address them. We cannot be sure, and I think DHS cannot be sure if it's doing enough because it doesn't have performance metrics which would allow it to assess what it is doing against its ultimate uh, objectives. So that is why we recommended that um, the department develop um, performance metrics which would allow it to assess all of the goals that it, progress against all of the goals that, it's, that it sets for itself and against the issues that it identifies when it does its MD715 analysis for the department and for each component. And how long have you been in your, uh, posi in your position as a director? Um, pardon? H how long have you been in your current position? Um, um, 16 years. And in your 16 years, have you seen uh, more women at the top uh, uh, at the decision-making table? Have you seen improvements? Uh, you mean at, at DHS yes. or across the federal government? Well, well, let's stick with DHS. Well, I actually, I, I, I have to say that we did not look at that pr mm. particular issue at DHS. We, we do know that there are more women at the top, but our report was focused on their processes and procedures mm -hmm. for completing their um, MD715 reports. Mm -hmm. But I, I would have to defer to Ms. Bailey in terms of actual numbers of increases of, of women. Okay, Ms. Bailey, um, you uh, may have heard about the 2018 internal study where I listed the three reasons people were leaving at higher rates. Um, what steps is the department taking to address each of these areas, the three areas that I mentioned? Thank you for your question. Uh, so with regard to the three areas, um, and I had mentioned this a little bit earlier, but we are synchronizing our efforts with regard to this. And so with regard to supervision, we had, um, I think it was two years ago, the year of the, the leader, where we put a concerted effort into all of our leadership development programs. And it's not just for our SES, but we also created a Bridges program and a few other programs so that, and a Joint Fellows program so that we could get down at the 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 level and not just the SES. So our goal is to build a cadre of leaders at a level that is lower than just at the SES level so that we can create these career advancement opportunities and also to focus in on the leadership development uh, for our current leaders, and not just about the nuts and bolts of how to be a supervisor, but actually how to care for the employees, how to make sure that we address what their concerns are so that we can actually make sure that they can carry out their missions. And I think the third one was the family issues, mm -hmm. I think was the third one. Sure. With regard to that, we put a concerted effort into our employee and family readiness program to ensure that we have um, that we are addressing their needs. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. And the gentleman's uh, time has expired. Thank you. You're back. I, I thank all of the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Uh, the members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we ask that you respond expeditiously in writing to the, those questions. Without objection, the committee record shall be kept open for 10 days. Hearing no further business, the subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>